And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Rick Ducat. Um, he's our Director of Engineering, and today he's going to be going over our uh, most recent release of Glue 1.3. Thanks, Betty. So as Betty said, I'm going to talk today about Glue 1.3. 1.3 was our latest stable release of Glue. Uh, if you're following along, we, we typically release a new kind of minor version of Glue every quarter. So we're currently working towards the 1.4 release. 1.3 was released at the end of the first quarter. And in this session, I really want to highlight a few of the, the key changes that went into 1.3, um, both internal and on the kind of performance and stability side, as well as uh, new functionality with the developer portal. But before we dive into it, um, let's just kind of step back a second and, and take the 10,000 foot view. If you're relatively new to Glue, what is it? Glue is an API gateway, uh, which is you know, a, a piece of software that's designed to address challenges that organizations face as they are kind of migrating towards um, some modern innovative development practices. So often when we talk to big enterprises, um, they're actually undergoing several changes or transformations one of which is is migrating away from you know legacy monolithic um, applications and development patterns towards microservices uh, along the way often taking advantage of new cloud offerings whether it's managed cloud services or um, things like serverless technology and and then obviously uh, we, in terms of how you run how you you package and distribute and actually run software kind of migrating to containers and to uh, container orchestration systems like Kubernetes. And so ideally when you're choosing an API gateway, you're kind of one, thinking about the challenges that come from microservices. So how do you manage all these new APIs? How do you um, secure them? Ensure that the traffic that's hitting your services is uh, secure and authorized. Um, you want to observe what's happening, be able to kind of manage the traffic over time maybe for your upgrade workflows and so forth. Um, but also you want your gateway to help with the migration towards these new technologies. So being able to kind of start to deploy more of a hybrid cloud uh, setup and take advantage of things like Kubernetes uh, with the right choice of gateway, you can, you can start to achieve all of that. So Glue is an API gateway uh, that's built on top of Envoy. Glue is a control plane for Envoy. Uh, and Envoy acts as our data plane. And uh, there's a couple key characteristics uh, of Glue. So first of all, we were kind of, by being built with Envoy, we we're kind of looking at where the community is going in terms of the proxy implementation. Envoy at this point is, is kind of the, pro, the kind of leading proxy of choice when you're building out a service mesh like Istio or, uh, or if you're kind of, you know, a lot of the kind of modern cloud native uh, API gateway technologies like Glue. But Glue is unique in that it uh, also works with uh, hybrid or, or non-Kubernetes stacks. So if you are an organization that hasn't yet gotten to Kubernetes or might not go that direction, uh, but still want to take advantage of kind of this, these modern technologies uh, like Envoy, you can deploy Glue on, uh, you know, and use, use other backends uh, like the Hashi stack to store your configuration, to orchestrate uh, changes and to manage your secrets. Um, the other nice thing about Glue is that it's been it's very flexible and extensible. So uh, we want to be able to integrate and connect any application, regardless of where it is or what it looks like, uh, and across any infrastructure or in any kind of complex, realistic enterprise environment. Uh, and we also built it to be pluggable. So we can see that uh, new functionality is coming in Envoy all the time. The community around this proxy is very large, and and as you've probably noticed. We've been investing in technology like WebAssembly to continue to drive and accelerate that innovation. And so um, to take advantage of that, we built Glue to be pluggable, to make it easy to expose new functionality, whether it's a, a configuration for a particular route to your service, something that you want um, Envoy to be doing at the gateway uh, or otherwise. Glue was launched back in uh, 2018, 2019, early 2019. Uh, and at this point, we've got a, a large number of customers and companies that are using Glue. So here are you know, some logos, um, companies like ADP, Park Mobile, Vonage, 
um, pretty large kind of well-known organizations are now using glue to kind of drive their production use cases. And I'd encourage you if you want to get a better understanding of, of exactly how um, those organizations are using glue. We've got a number of testimonials on our website. Uh, there have been a series of blog posts with some of these customers just going into detail, um, both about their usage of glue and, and how it fits into the context of their broader organizational um, kind of technological push. So with the background out of the way, let's talk about Glue 1.3. So Glue 1.3 was released, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, at the end of Q1, so really at the, you know, April 1st, April 2nd is when the initial version came out. Uh, as you've probably noticed working with Solo uh, or kind of watching Solo, we, we try to push out changes very quickly. So we've, we've shipped a couple patch releases since then. I think we're on 1.3.6 is the version that I'm going to be showcasing here today. Um, the highlights for 1.3 for us, first and foremost, are the developer portal. Um, so I'm going to be giving a demo and I'll go into a lot more detail about this uh, in the second half of this presentation. I'll, so I'll come back to that. Um, but there were a number of other improvements or, or highlights to call out for this release. Uh, we, we are starting to experimentally support WebAssembly. If you go to our website, you'll notice we've got a new um, site that we've published called WebAssembly Hub. We've been doing some work with Google and with uh, the broader Envoy community to help make web WebAssembly the future of how you can innovate and customize the behavior of Envoy. Uh, and so with Glue, we can kind of now experimentally support WebAssembly. It's not yet really, um, I'd say a graduated or mature technology from Envoy's perspective or from our perspective, but it's something that is now becoming an option and we see it as the future. Um, beyond that, we've, we made a number of enhancements to better support use cases around Knative. Um, we made a large focus of the quarter as a team on just the stability and performance of Glue, as well as kind of the usability and um, diagnosing when there's a problem, being able to troubleshoot and fix that problem. Uh, and finally, related to all of that, we've made a major emphasis on improving and uh, making the documentation much more useful for everyone. So just to go, you know, double click on those a little bit. Um, as we've been uh, with Glue, we've been kind of a provider for Knative serving uh, for about a year now. We made a, a series of enhancements um, together with our, our community. And actually, I, I meant to say, uh, this is, you know, it's a good time to mention a lot of the improvements, both in terms of feedback, but also in terms of the code itself have come from, uh, you know, just the great um, engagement that we're getting from our community. We really appreciate um, both the feedback and the contributions. Um, and uh, there were a number of folks that contributed changes um, to a lot of the stuff that we'll be talking about today. So you can see the names on the right. Uh, and I'm excited to see that this number is growing. So for 1.4, I expect we'll have um, an even longer list uh, as users are finding ways to actually make contributions back to Glue, which is great to see. And that's how you know a lot of the feedback and kind of contributions for Knative um, came about. I also mentioned documentation to to kind of like highlight what that looks like. We now have a much more organized um, set of docs. So if you go to the docs website, uh, which I highly recommend you doing if you're kind of researching or trying to use Glue, we now have much better organizational structure. Um, there's a comprehensive set of guides, and we tried to organize it in a way that you can more intuitively find what you're looking for. Um, so if you find that that's not your experience, I would strongly recommend just filing an issue in the Glue repo. We're, we're eager and trying to make improvements to the documentation every day. Uh, the other thing worth calling out is we now have versioned docs. So if you're a user running 1.3 or running a particular version, uh, we can now go back and kind of maintain a view of, of that version as Glue um, evolves over time. Another section of improvements that I wanted to call out here. Uh, so on the routing side, we've added, uh, we added a few things in 1.3 that uh, are really useful from the perspective of people trying to figure out how to scale their use of glue across their organization. Um, and in particular, what I'm talking about is delegation. So as you probably know, 
Glue has this feature called delegation where you could define your routes in a separate CRD uh, called a route table. And your virtual service can use, uh, starting in 1.3, can use selectors. So it can uh, say grab all of the route tables in a particular namespace or grab the route tables that uh, have a particular label uh, key value pair. By using selectors, we can kind of decouple uh, the configuration of your domain of your virtual service from uh, the route table itself. And that means that we've had users that have used this to actually start to scale a self-service model of deploying and configuring Glue, where individual development teams who own their services can also own a route table to their for the routes to those services, um, while a central team can kind of manage the domain, can manage how that all wires up together in a virtual service. And we had a customer that needed some more fine-grained ability to customize the, the ordering of the routes uh, when they get assembled in that way. And so we, we introduced another feature called weights on route tables to help uh, kind of uh, inform Glue when there is um, some important kind of uh, input about how the routes should be ordered. And then the other um, thing that to call out is uh, we've We've done work to ensure, you know, we, we basically most of our customers are operating in some kind of limited or zero trust environment where all communication should be secure, should be uh, mutual TLS. And so where this hasn't been the case or, you know, whether it's between glue and the pieces of the data plane. Uh, uh, so we, for instance, we needed to expand the ability for glue to talk to Grafana, to talk to the external loss server, uh, to support the TLS use cases that our customers have. Finally, there's a, there's a laundry list of just sm small improvements, uh, either you know performance stability, usability, um, just to kind of make the experience of working with Glue as good as possible for all of our users. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you know a big emphasis was considering it uh, you know urgent priority anytime. Uh, we found that we could report errors more clearly. Uh, we could detect errors and actually kind of address them either with metrics or with additional checks uh, in Glue CTL. Uh, and basically moving towards a world where we can fully automate kind of the health checking and monitoring of, of Glue, uh, even kind of as teams are undergoing operational workflows that are changing or testing new configuration. So the, the, the big thing I want to focus on in the rest of the webinar is our developer portal, which is a real kind of new large functionality in the 1.3 release. And it's going to be a continued investment for us moving forward. Uh, so in 1.3, this is really our MVP, uh, but I, I wanted to share kind of how we're thinking about the developer portal. So far with Glue, we've seen that we can kind of manage routes, we can secure them, um, but we're not necessarily kind of uh, we weren't necessarily supporting the experience of, I want to kind of package a bunch of these routes into an API bundle. Uh, I want to expose that bundle to potential developers that are building against these APIs so that they can explore the documentation. Um, they can request API keys and actually um, securely access those APIs. Uh, and so from the, in, the, in that sense, to enable that, we saw kind of two pieces of the workflow. First, there's an administrative side where someone is actually kind of configuring a portal, uh, an actual site that we want to add APIs into, um, specifying what those APIs are, who has access to them, uh, and managing kind of uh, the scope when for, uh, for API keys that users can generate. So that's kind of the administrative side. And, and in addition to that, there's some lightweight customization. So want to be able to, obviously, if you're presenting your kind of APIs in a portal, it's meant for consumption. You probably want that portal to be branded, to be with some kind of images and colors and so forth. Um, and so all of that is kind of, we consider part of the administrative experience for the dev portal. Then there's the developer experience. So I need to uh, be able to serve a website that I can log into, or I can have developers log into. and can see the APIs that they have access to, can explore the documentation, and can generate API keys. And so that's the developer side. And, and with the developer portal 1.3 release, we wanted to 
provide an MVP, an initial version of both of those experiences. And with that, I'll shift into a demo to show you. So let's take a look at the developer portal. The first thing that we're going to do is install uh, Glue Enterprise. And in 1.3, we now have a new Helm value that we can turn on uh, to actually deploy the developer portal. So let's do the install. The Helm value for reference is here. It's called dev portal uh, enabled true. So just a single value that we can use to turn on this feature. Now, as this is going, uh, we're also going to deploy a demo application, which is our kind of standard pet store API demo. So I'm going to apply that now. Basically, this creates a service and a deployment. Uh, it's just a simple API and we're going to expose it in Glue uh, with a virtual service that kind of looks like this. So if we uh, will create a virtual service called Pet Store, uh, we're going to include some cores um, configuration so that later when we access this through a dev portal, uh, things work fine. Um, and we're going to be doing a bunch of port forwarding rather than worry about DNS. So I'm just going to access this on the domain localhost 8080. And as we can see, there's a single route here on our virtual service to the pet store um, API endpoint. Apply that. Just going to make sure that Glue's, uh, looks like Glue's fully running. We can see the dev portal resources there. Um, and we should immediately see this service exposed in on, uh, through Envoy. Um, so I'm going to port forward, set up my port forward now. So set up, uh, have Envoy be port forwarded uh, on port 8080. So now if I issue curl requests, uh, we can see that uh, the pets API endpoint returned successfully. So this is exposed through Glue's uh, gateway proxy service um, because we've configured that virtual service. So the first thing that we can do um, to create a portal for this is actually open up the Glue UI. I need to set up a port forward here. So I'm going to be exposing the admin UI on port 8081. As we can see, the Glue is healthy. Uh, there's a single virtual service, which is the pet store that we just created. Uh, and in 1.3, we now have this extra tab called Dev Portal. And so with Dev Portal, we'll be creating portal objects, which are the actual kind of sites that users can log into and, and click around and explore uh, the content. Uh, we'll be defining APIs, which are the kind of actual API packages, which are, is a bundle of, uh, of open API spec. So a bundle of endpoints and services uh, with some additional configuration that we'll use as part of Glue. Uh, and then finally, as part of the developer portal, we're also managing users and groups. Uh, so that we can kind of assign access to those APIs in those portals. So first we'll create a portal. We'll call it pet store. I'm going to use the domain localhost 1234. And let's give it a description. And now like one of the things that you'd be doing as part of configuring a portal is, is branding and um, and styling. So I'm, I'm adding a hero Im image, which is like a long horizontal image that sits in the background and then also adding a logo and an icon. We haven't defined any APIs, so we'll skip those sections. And I need to set up one more port forward because now we're kind of, so to access the actual developer UI, I'll be logging into, or I'll be connecting over, uh, uh, to the dev portal container or service. And so I'm port forwarding that as well. And, and that's going to be port forwarded on one, two, three, four. So that's kind of why we defined that localhost one, two, three, four as our domain for the portal. Let's see how that works. Great, so now we're, we're kind of actually at, we've, we actually have a portal. This is kind of a developer facing UI. It looks like I still have a session from before. So let me just, Clear the state. So now we can log in. We can see I don't actually have APIs to view. And if I did, I would need to log in anyway. There's no other static content. So this is a very simple portal. 
first thing that we can show is adding some basic content. So let's put a page on here. We'll just, create, we'll just call it test. Um, this is just to show that we can add a page uh, of static content. We can um, include it in the navigation. We can display it on the main page. And we can even add some kind of markdown content. Um, and publish that and it should immediately take effect. So if I go over to the portal, we can see that um, we now see this new test tab in our navigation. Um, the test page has the content that we, we produced, including the markdown content uh, rendered as you'd expect. And because we included it on the main page, we see this tile here. So the next thing, we want to do is actually add some APIs and we want to add the pet store service into this portal. So we'll go back and we'll create an API. And again, we'll, we'll, can we have the opportunity to provide some kind of basic branding. So I'm going to just, use the glue logo again, and I'm going to select the pet store portal. So I want to publish this API into that portal. And I still don't have any users or groups, so we can leave it at that. And we can now see that this is associated uh, in the portal as we expect. However, in order to actually view it, I need to be able to log in. So I'm going to create a user for myself, uh, and I'll, I'll actually make it as part of a group. So let me create a developers group. Um, I don't yet have a user, that's okay. The developers group is going to achieve, uh, attain access to our API in our portal. And I'll create a user now for me. Um, the email address here is optional, so I'm just going to add myself to that group. Great, so now I'm a user in the developers group and the developers group has access to um, the API in our portal. So if I log in as this user, I should be able to kind of see that API. Let's try that. So if I log in, so that worked, but I need to provide my own passwords. And let me do that. And now I'm, I'm logged in. I can see I'm logged in up here in the top right. And if I view the APIs now, I can see that there is an API that's been published into this portal. And if we click on it, we can actually start to explore what that API looks like. So I can see here that there are four um, endpoints. Here's an example of a get endpoint. Um, I can even try this out. And we can see the endpoints returning the JSON response that we'd expect. Um, so this looks like everything's working as we expect, which is great. Um, and this, this is standard Swagger tooling, so we can see the shapes of the models, um, as well as all of the endpoints and the documentation. And as, a, as an administrator, if I wanted to go and customize what the API definition looked like, I could do that. Um, there's an API editor that lets me kind of change and preview those changes. Um, for now, I'll just leave that. Uh, but what I'd like to do is lock down this API so that only users that have been granted access can actually uh, can actually initiate calls to those, uh, initiate those requests to those endpoints. Um, so the first concept that we need to kind of utilize in order to make this possible is an API key scope. A scope basically is a way for administrators to allow users to create their own API keys um, and it defines the boundaries for those keys. So I'm going to call this a pet key scope. I'm going to assign it to the pet store portal and I'm going to say that the Swagger pet store, that API that we added to the portal is in scope, which means that a user should be able to now log in if they have this scope be able to create their own api keys so over here we can see uh, oops i'll go to the api keys i'll see now that there is a scope 
uh, there's an API in the scope and I'll, I'll add an API key. We'll come back to this in a second. The other thing I need to do to actually lock down the API is associate with it this external auth configuration, which basically enforces that Envoy will check the API key before forwarding the request onto this endpoint. Um, and so, and the, um, the auth config that it was referenced is one that we provide that says basically there needs to be a key that has this pet store key scope that we expect. Sorry, pet key scope. So let me apply this. And then I will apply the virtual service change to actually update that. And now this will take a second to actually propagate. Glue needs to validate the config and actually propagate it to external auth and to Envoy. Um, we can see the we can see when that takes effect by checking um, our proxy representation, which is Glue's representation of the kind of object that's going to be translated into Envoy config. So I applied our virtual service change. I'm waiting for it to take effect in this um, proxy object. If we continue to watch this thing for changes, we still haven't seen the change yet. Let's Uh, the, the reason for the slowdown is we're kind of doing some validation. So when these resources were created, um, the, uh, we're first kind of validating that the auth config exists and it makes sense and it works um, before we produce this proxy object. Uh, and then Glue is actually translating that into Envoy config and pushing it along. It's worth noting that we've now added also an allowed header here. So the API key uh, header should be allowed by our cores configuration. So this configuration basically enables the Swagger UI to, to initiate requests to this, um, to, our, our, to our endpoint. Taking a while to propagate, so I'm going to force the issue. Okay, so now we have this proxy object that has our external auth config and shortly it should be actually translated into Envoy's config. As soon as the status updates to one, that's how we know that it actually took effect. And it looks like now it has been accepted. And so we can continue. Um, at this point, the virtual service should be blocking requests. Uh, it should be configured so that requests that don't include the API key um, header should be blocked as forbidden. So let's try that. If we look at the actual kind of response, we're seeing it's forbidden. So that's exactly as we expect. Now we can go over to the, um, the UI and actually try out the endpoint with the key that we just generated. So let me grab that API key, go back to the endpoint. 
And first I'll try it without um, authorizing it. So if I try this, we should see error forbidden. So we're getting a 403 response because we haven't provided that, that header. Um, now let's fix that. Let's provide this. Oops. Let's grab that key again and let's um, provide it. Now, if we try it out, we should be able to. Oh, we're still getting a forbidden. Looks like we have a slight mistake in our actual key here. So let me fix that again. So now we should actually see this work. Looks like that works now. So if we go back to the UI with that key, we should be able to see it work now. Just took a second to propagate. So I'll authorize it with that API key and then I'll uh, try it out here and execute. And now we see it working. So basically um, by kind of adding the uh, so basically in our swagger definition, we had created some secure, some additional authorization or security kind of requirements for these APIs. Um, when I changed the virtual service to now require this auth config and require, look for a valid API key, um, that means that we now need to actually provide that in order to access the API. Otherwise we'll get this 403. And so when I created the key and, and actually got it working, then, um, then now we're seeing it was forbidden before, and now I can uh, achieve, I can, I can get a 200 response from this API once I provide that key as we expect. So that's the basic demo. Uh, as we can see, there's a few different kind of pieces here that you have to independently kind of manage together. So the linking in this version of the API keys to the portals and to back to the kind of actual routing configuration is a little bit separated. So one of the things that we're trying to improve for the next version of Glue is to actually kind of drive that all from a single source of truth, which is most likely the open API spec um, that's being produced. That should help kind of generate Glue routing configuration as well as generate kind of the portal um, API definitions themselves. Um, the great thing about this is it's all kind of declarative APIs. So all the things that we were doing through the UI is are things that we could be doing uh, just with CRDs and, and linking it together back to the other resources in Kubernetes. Uh, and in that way, 
this is a fully declarative developer portal that could be in, in our production setting could be managed entirely through standard kind of GitOps uh, infrastructure management. So very much looking forward to some improvements about uh, you know, making it easier to configure in the next version. Uh, and the other change that we're kind of looking at is enabling kind of integration with a customer's identity provider. So rather than having to allocate and assign users in the Glue UI, we should just be able to you know, pull those in from some third party identity provider and use the standard single sign on mechanism inside of an enterprise. I'll open up to questions. Unfortunately, I didn't get quite to the end of my demo, but um, hopefully that at least paints a picture. And um, rather than debug that for the next 15 minutes, let's uh, open it up to questions. Betty, if you want to moderate and, uh, and we can kind of spend the time on that. Yeah, and as part of our follow-up, we can also um, provide an up, provide a demo with um, provide a demo video with that um, de situation debugged. Um, there actually is a quite a number of questions here. Um, there are a number of questions about auth. Um, so, I uh, you know asking if we support LDAP, um, you know uh, uh, Jots and um, uh, open I OIDC, Open ID Connect. And I think what we what would be great, Rick, is if you could go over like. What are the off um, uh, the various off options that we support in Glue as a gateway? Um, what's in the Dev Portal today, and where we're taking it? Sure. So in Glue, there there's a couple of ways of thinking about it. The first is, uh, and I'm going to focus on Glue Enterprise. Uh, with Glue Open Source, you can hook in your own custom authentication backend and support whatever you want. Envoy has kind of a a specific API that you can define that you can implement as part of, of exposing a particular auth um, uh, implementation. Built into Enterprise Glue, we've got a number of options out of the box. Um, so, and I'll show the kind of list here. So we have um, so there's basic auth, which is more of mostly just a dictionary. This isn't really like necessarily a common production use case. A very common um, auth mechanism for user facing APIs is more of an OAuth, OIDC kind of workflow where you can kind of hook up a consent screen in front of your application and the user has to log in and then get redirected back to your application. Uh, we also allow for, uh, as part of kind of acquiring and authenticating, you can define an API key you could uh, define some custom logic in an open policy agent kind of um, authorization step. We've got an integration with LDAP. And finally, we've got what's called plugin auth. So if, if these aren't the right ways to perform authentication or if you need to do additional checks, um, you can define your own Go plugin that gets built and packaged into the external auth server. Um, and we've had people do uh, plugins for things like very customized HMAC validation, for instance. Um, now, a nice thing about Glue and our external auth implementation is that we can chain these things together. So what I see are two common patterns for, um, for kind of authentication, depending on whether the, the client is a user or is more of like machine to machine. So for user facing auth, one, a pretty common pattern is you log in with an OIDC flow with OAuth, and then you might perform additional authorization checks based on the token or the JOT that came back from, his, from that handshake. And so you could have an OAuth um, flow and then a second step in your auth config that does some authorization on the JOT that was returned, um, for instance, with open policy agent. Um, so that's a really common kind of integration that we see if it's a user facing um, API and for machine to machine, usually it's uh, starting from a token. Maybe it's, it's often a jot, like, you know, the typically it kind of, you, you have a jot or you acquire a jot uh, and then we can kind of verify that jot and maybe do additional authorizations um, similar to how we're doing additional authorizations uh, when if on the, on what the, on the, uh, jot for it after a user gets logged in. So it's kind of, those are the two sides of it. We often see kind of with machine to machine, there might be different considerations, like you care about rate limiting and other security concerns. Um, but the nice thing about Glue is you can compose these and piece and tie them multiple implementations together. Did that address the, 
scope of the question, Betty? Yeah, so there was just a, um, there was a number of very sp uh, specific questions about if we supported specific um, auth systems. And so this overview is great. And then um, uh, going in, so on the glue side, and then um, on the portal side, you know, you showed kind of, um, you showed the API key. And if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what we're doing, yeah. advancing the auth there on the portal. Yeah, so the, the very basic thing that we have right now is just API keys where uh, and, and actually stepping back, um, it's based on users that I'm defining kind of in as a glue admin in the UI. So right now in this version, these are backed by secrets and Kubernetes really just designed. Our initial customers had essentially, you know, under 100 users that are logging in from as developer users to the portal. Um, and so it was kind of safe and like fine to back those with Kubernetes secrets but not necessarily like a, a, a real long-term answer. So what we're looking at now is how do we integrate with the right, with our customer's identity provider so that my login as a developer into this portal is a standard kind of single sign-on flow. Um, and with that, we're kind of looking to integrate a typical kind of OIDC style flow. So I, I'd look for, for that more as a 1.4 feature. It's something that we're, we're kind of putting into, we're, we're doing the planning and work on to kind of put into the next version of the developer portal. Yes, coming soon. So um, if you all are interested in this, um, you know, give this a try, give the current version a try today and then um, hop into the community Slack um, so we can discuss, um, you know, the, the, the work in 1.4 for this, and if there's any specific um, areas related to auth that you're interested in for the dev portal. Um, next question here, there's a question specifically around, um, you know, the, the, the routing and such. Um, you know, there's a question on, is this scenario possible, um, glue to client to glue with um, HTTP, server WebSocket, and then um, client WebSocket. And, um, you know, I know we support listen listeners on HTTP, WebSocket, GRPC, and TCP, correct? Sorry, is, is which scenario? What was the, the question exactly? Around having glue, um, glue to HTTP um, WebSocket uh, for both the client and the server. And so the scenario is they have a microservice um, that they want to connect to a WebSocket server, um, and, then I'll, um, and then to HTTP endpoint. I see. So kind of like on one side, it's H, it's standard HTTP, but want to kind of on the on the back side connect over socket. Um, I, I think that kind of thing is doable. We have that is like an upstream type. So in, in glue, we, we kind of represent these destinations as upstreams. Um, there's different types of upstreams designed really to kind of handle these kind of like different scenarios. I would have to look into the specifics of the use case with respect to sockets, but I suspect, um, I, I, I think it's doable and I suspect we already should be able to support it because we've done some work to make, um, to make these kind of socket style uh, upstreams work. Yeah, and so um, uh, Turkle who asked that question, please hop into our uh, Slack and you can hop into the Glue channel and we can discuss further um, on this specifically. Um, another question here is, uh, is it possible to make Glue listen on port 80 and 443 in non-cloud Kubernetes deployments? So pretty specific um, here. Is it possible to make it listen on, on non-default non ports, basically? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's all configurable. It's actually quite nice. I think in Glue, um, so I can show you some a resource. Basically, we have this proxy object. Um, and it will show you essentially which bind ports we're, we're using. So the standard ones, 443 and 80, um, are the two, you know, are the are the standard, are the standard ways we bind routes. So if there is an SSL config, we'll use the HTTPS port. Um, but all of that is configurable. Um, these are just defaults. So the way in which you can customize that is by looking at and editing or adding new gateway CRDs. The gateway CRD is, it's kind of the thing that controls the Envoy listener itself. So there should be one gateway CRD per port. And that port, you know, we don't need to use the default ports. Uh, we don't, we can customize these to be different ports. Um, what is somewhat limited, I will admit, is kind of our, 
home chart values that are uh, that we can customize. So uh, yeah, we, should, you know, happy to, you know, I would, if you have trouble kind of figuring out how to expose that port either in the Kubernetes service for the proxy or, you know, on the container, uh, I would just ping the team. We were happy to help, but I think um, using kind of non-standard or multiple gateways on different ports is a very common use case. Um, and a question here on does the first, uh, does the Dev Portal support um, other interfaces beyond REST? Like, could they publish gRPC or GraphQL? Great question. Uh, so we have been working through kind of gRPC as the next protocol. It's kind of definitely uh, in something that we're looking at uh, now. Exactly what that means? Like I think. Um, a lot of the Swagger slash Open API tooling is geared towards REST, but I think um, trying to provide something similar and uh, for our gRPC uh, customers, yeah. And then um, last question here um, for today's: Does Glue work along with Istio or is a replacement? And this um, Glue as a gateway with Service Mesh. This is a this is a question we get frequently, and I think it doesn't hurt um, for us to answer it again. Yeah, so the so Glue will work seamlessly with Istio. Uh, we view the API gateway and the service mesh in general as complementary technologies. So with the API gateway, you're really thinking about how you secure and manage at your application at the edge. So this is kind of managing the proxy that sits between your clients, your downstream clients, and your upstream services. With the service mesh, you're now you're kind of controlling the um, data plane that's uh, all the sidecars that sit between your services, and it's really geared towards managing how services communicate with other services, also known as your east-west traffic. So, in general, we view those two things as complementary and really often have separate concerns. So what you care about at the edge are probably a lot of things related to security, rate limiting, WAF, um, potentially a fair amount of like advanced routing features, um, but, but mainly for those kind of services that are directly accessed by your users and directly exposed through your gateway. Um, and then you would use your service mesh for kind of how, whatever workflows that you have with respect to internal east-west traffic. Um, so tracing, observability, MTLS, um, uh, to name a few, even, even things like routing and canarying and so forth are, are all very meaningful features. Um, I mean, meaningful in both places, but commonly done between every service to service communication. Whereas like, you know, the, the kind of initial authentication authorization some of the stuff that you would do at the edge would be either superfluous or a performance liability um, if it if it was done kind of between every two sidecar requests. Cool. 